Scared to Death is explicit in every way. Please take care while listening. Whether thou art a ghost that hath come from the earth, earth, or a phantom of night that hath no home, or one that lieth dead in the desert, or a ghost unburied, or a demon, or a ghoul, whatever thou be, until thou art removed, thou shalt find here no water to drink. Thou shalt not stretch forth thy hand to our own. Into our house enter thou not. Through our fence break through thou not. We are protected, though we may be frightened. Our life you may not steal, though we may be scared to death. Welcome to Scared to Death, Creeps, Peepers, Robertson, Annabelle's. I'm Dan. Hello, Stud Muffin. Hello. <laughs> I'm Lindsay. <laughs> uh, very- you, look, you look jacked. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Ladies, gentlemen, <laughs> do you want to weigh in on this? 315! <laughs> I feel like I'm just getting uh, after a little vacation back back into lifting. I don't I don't feel too strong. I have zero motivation to go to the gym and lift. <laughs> I've been really into sleep. Sleep is good. It is. A uh, very very uh, uh, just quick announcements today, and then we're jumping in. Um, thanks again for the ratings and reviews. Starting off there, uh, so many new creeps and peepers for whatever reason finding the show. Uh, thank you and stay a while. And your reviews will help us find even more new listeners. So that is very appreciated. Good job, guys. We're proud of you. <laughs> and all of you should watch my new stand-up special, Trying to Get Better, free on YouTube. I think it's my best one. Drop it on the Bad Magic Productions YouTube channel this Sunday, August 27th, 4 p.m. Pacific time. Please watch, uh, like, and share it. I would like it if you were like, you know, and it's like my most okayest material. Like, it's it's not great. Eh. It's, not, it's not bad. <laughs> you, would, you wouldn't say it was bad, but like... <laughs> <laughs> um, and if you also, if you want stickers for our street team, um, we have a few more in. Hopefully, as you hear this, they're still there. Check the badmagicmerch.com store. We just snuck in a restock uh, because the first round went so fast. And then once these are gone, they're gone, gone. Like, like really gone until next year. <laughs> and then last thing, uh, this week's merch announcement. Uh, Logan tells me this is his favorite piece. Have you seen this? Uh-uh. Okay. I don't always look because sometimes I like a surprise. Oh, you might want to check this out. This is He said it's his favorite piece in a long time, which is concerning. This is a true creeper piece. Most disturbing graphic he has put together in quite some time. Introducing the Life in Plastic collection. A nod to the wi- wildly successful Barbie movie release or something more sinister. I'm going to go with sinister. Gives me heavy American horror story vibes. Also, the the victim on the shirt looks a lot like you. Oh, nice. So Logan's frustrated at work. I see. <laughs> Maybe. It's definitely like a dead Lindsay kind of vibe in the in the okay. graphic. Well, listen, you guys. He wouldn't be the first person to wish me dead. <laughs> I don't think he's It's just some dark inspiration of some sort. Uh, Logan's fired next week. <laughs> head on over to badmagicmerch.com. At least check out the new tea, wall art, or blanket. And then, you, can, you could get the wall art and use it as oh a dartboard. Boy. For all the other people who don't like me. No, but <laughs> don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> well, I think that's funny. Uh, and now for some horror. Do you, okay. you care if I set up my tales first? I, I absolutely do not. Yeah, no, please. Okay, my first of two tales today takes us to Arkansas, to the grounds of a former treatment facility for tuberculosis. Mm. A disease that ran rampant in the U.S. for decades and decades. Uh, we've learned that hospitals and as- asylums are hotbeds for paranormal activity. This sanatorium, no different. So history, lore, modern encounter. And then for my second story, we're going to head to Scotland, visit a haunted castle. Uh, castle Fraser is reportedly haunted by numerous spirits, and we'll share some history, a bit of lore, and then two modern encounter cl- uh, claims. When Monroe found out she was just a little bit Scottish, she went she went wild with it because Kyler was so irritated that it didn't show up on his like twenty three and Me, yep. and he just could not accept that they could be of the same parents. Right. But not have exactly the same breakdown of like genetic code. Yeah, and he. I mean, he would get so angry. And he would get weirdly worked up about it. Yeah, and and subsequently, as siblings do, Monroe then continued to talk about Scotland mm-hmm. as if it was like, it yeah, was her, it was her homeland. Oh, yeah, not, not his, but hers. Yeah, when we went there, she's she, so Scottish. <laughs> oh, well, I have <laughs> two really awesome tales this week. My first tale: uh, are people in a small town being marked for taking? Ooh. Uh, yes. Uh, a string of disappearances that has been going on for some time, and that is fun to investigate. And then my second tale, not good for me, a possible alien alien abduction. Oh, yeah. And we don't get a ton of those on the fan side. No. And yes, you guys, I know that the government, that there's been a recent, like, 
interview. I ref- I'm refusing to watch it. I'm refusing to read about it. I understand. Thank you for all the emails. I understand that the government is like finally saying there are aliens. I like, I'm doing this. No, 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 no. I don't even want to know. I don't even want to know. Well, I just, just want to clarify um, that the, the government as a whole is not saying that. Okay. One person, congressional testimony is saying that the many people in the government are aware of it, but this is just a person. Okay. 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 That does make me feel a little bit better. So, and, you know, still no bodies. Uh, you know, there's rumors about it, but it's like, come on, show us, show us the pictures. I just, or don't, better. don't. Yeah. Show I, us the video or something. No, or don't. Let's just leave it open-ended. All right. You, you socked up and safe. I am. Look at these babies. I found a pile of socks huh? and uh, I'm sorry to any fans who sent these in a while ago. They just got buried in my sock pile. But look how yeah, cute. Are, like, I'm calling them electric oh, cactus. Ari- Arizona vibes. So cute. Desert. Okay. So thank you. Well, I'm going to share a little bit of a historical setup before getting into the uh, paranormal encounter with this first one. Okay. By the dawn of the 19th century, tuberculosis, or consumption, as it was commonly known then, was the leading cause of death in the United States. People unfortunate enough to contract this disease would suffer from hacking, bloody coughs, debilitating pain in their lungs, fatigue, and more. Throughout much of the 1800s, victims of TB often sought treatment in sanatoriums, where it was believed that rest in a healthy climate could, if not cure the disease, greatly extend one's life with it and reduce its symptoms. It wasn't until 1882 that anyone even knew how one contracted consumption. Many assumed it was inherited, since after one family member came down with it, other infected family members seemed to usually follow. Finally, Dr. Robert Koch, a German physician and researcher, discovered that the disease was spread through a highly contagious form of bacteria. After some initial hesitation, the Western medical community accepted Koch's finding, and the U.S. launched a massive public health campaign to educate citizens on how to best treat and prevent this horrible disease. However, uh, what would not arrive for almost another 70 years was an actual cure. So sanatoriums remained. Sanatoriums that were viewed moving into the 20th century as a form of hospice care, since by then doctors knew that virtually no one ever survived the disease. Most patients sent to sanatoriums would live anywhere from 10 months to two years, and for many, in increasingly crowded sanatoriums, those final months weren't altogether that comfortable. Residents would be crowded into rooms, barrack style, with no privacy, not enough orderlies and nurses meant bed sores and other avoidable infections, food was often of the lowest quality and not always evenly distributed and basic common-sense methods of care were not always followed. Windows might be left open at night in the dead of winter, with residents waking up with snow covering their blankets. The Arkansas State Tuberculosis Sanatorium was one of many of these places when it first opened its doors in 1909, about three miles south of the little town of Boonville in Logan County. Once fully established, the sanatorium became the state's primary relocation center for Arkansas with tuberculosis. Or Arkansans, Arkan, Arkans, Arkansans. Uh, is how it's said. I should have looked it up. Uh, somebody from Arkansas. Oh, Arkansinians. <laughs> anyway, for residents, let it, I'll just say residents with tuberculosis. That word looks good in print. Spell check didn't catch it, but I'm like, ah. Arkansasers. Uh, by the time the facility closed in 1973, over 70,000 patients had been treated in its main hospital, the Nyberg Building, and nearly 70,000 had died. Besides the Nyberg Building, the facility had many other structures, including dormitories, staff quarters, entertainment buildings, a chapel, a laundry, its own water treatment plant, even a private fire department. Today, most of these structures are still in use in some form or another. On February 26, 1973, the last seven patients were discharged, and the following month, the Arkansas legislature approved authorizing the facility's closure. Then, three months later, on June 30th, the Arkansas State Tuberculosis Sanatorium officially closed, and the main gates were left unlocked for the first time in more than 60 years. Today, the facility operates as the Boonville Human Development Center and is classified as a historic site. Also, an attractive destination for paranormal researchers. Paranormal activity has been reported for years, with staff and visitors alike claiming to hear strange noises or see ghosts. Many Class A EVP recordings have been captured. There have been instances of people visiting and losing track of time, feeling a deep need to never leave, and even months after leaving, reporting still feeling drawn to the grounds. Thousands and thousands of people over more than six decades never found their way out of the Nyberg building after arriving, at least not while they still lived. Thousands died there gasping and choking as they struggled to breathe in their final moments. 
How many of those tortured souls remain? The following is the claim of one man who reported coming face to face with one of these souls roughly two decades ago. Time now for the tale of the girl on the second floor. In the early 2000s, I did seasonal work for the annual haunted house at what we now call the Colony or the Hill. Once known formally as the Arkansas State Tuberculosis Sanatorium, best known as the Arkansas Sanatorium. My job was to help construct and decorate the different haunted scenes for the walk through the main building, the Nyberg Building. The Nyberg Building is the one you can see from Boonville Mountain in the distance. I worked there every October for four years in a row. My first two years, we set up all our scary stuff in the basement. And then my next two years, we set up on the first or main floor. One year, I was part of the crew that threw spaghetti noodles over the tarp when the masked chainsaw man attacked the dummy on the other side. The screams we got out of people were hilarious. We had always been told not to go beyond the first floor. And it made sense. We had bathrooms, offices, all of our haunted scenes, everything we needed between the basement and the main floor. There was no need to go snooping around anywhere else. But now I wonder if maybe there was another reason to keep us off the upper floors. Last year I worked there, some of my buddies and I decided to shoot the shit a bit when we showed up uh, one day. As we smoked outside, we looked up at the Nyberg building and started telling spooky stories. I had heard most of these stories already, but still hadn't encountered any anything myself. A couple guys talked about the area they called the cage and how the air felt electrified every time you wandered into that area. Even if you didn't hear or see anything, you just felt something. You knew you weren't alone. Finally, another guy upped the ante. I thought he had to have been telling a tall tale. He talked about a spirit he called the girl on the second floor, similar to the name of that one horror movie. He said, I've been up there many times and I've even played games with her. I couldn't help but laugh. Bullshit. Come on, man, I said. He was a little pissed, but the rest of the group backed me up. Nobody believed him. Okay, you don't believe me, smart asses, he said. Then go take a look up there for yourself and go up there alone after the sun goes down. I bet you won't last 10 minutes. The rest of the group mumbled and shook their heads, kept laughing about it. We still didn't believe him. But also, no one volunteered to go up there by themselves. They said it was stupid, a waste of time, and I agreed. But were some of them also actually maybe a little scared to head up there in the dark alone? I think they were. Being the biggest self-proclaimed skeptic in the group, I volunteered. Okay, after we're done working for the night, I'll go up there and check it out. At least one of you isn't a coward, Mr. Girl on the second floor mumbled. Everyone laughed at how irritated he was. And we finished our cigarettes and headed inside with a load of equipment and creepy haunted house props. Soon it was dusk, and with the forest around the grounds hiding the sinking sun, the pink-orange light of the darkening sky made the shadows creep in that much quicker. We all worked on the main floor, hanging up the walls and decorating. And not long after we started, I heard something upstairs. Over all the noise we were making, it sounded like footsteps. Did y'all hear that? I asked. We all stopped working to listen. After not hearing it again for several moments, I was ready to write it off. But then it started up again, and luckily everyone else heard it too. Maybe there's a maintenance worker up there, security, someone speculated. I chuckled. Guess I'll be finding out soon. And then the guy who told the story of the girl said, why don't you just head up there now, get it over with? Since we all just heard something, it'll be the best time to investigate. I bet that was her. The rest of the group agreed, and I shrugged. What the hell, I figured. Might as well. No better time than the present and all that. I imagine doing some exploring would either reaffirm my belief that all of this ghost stuff was bullshit, or maybe finally make a believer out of me. It'd be a win-win, I guess, was what I was thinking. The noise upstairs stopped as my buddies walked with me to the base of the stairs, and now I was on my own. I'm not afraid to say that despite my skepticism, I was a bit nervous. The other guys watched as I slowly walked up, teasing me as I went. Oh my God, watch out! One of them yelled and about jumped out of my skin. I also stumbled and almost fell back down the stairs. Guys had a real good laugh over that. The guy who yelled hadn't actually seen anything, of course. He was just being an asshole and trying to scare me. Mission accomplished. I recomposed myself. Tried not to think about how flushed I must be. I was so embarrassed he got me so good when I supposedly didn't even believe in this stuff. Why was I nervous? I'd been working there for four years now, every October, and I had never once seen or heard anything I couldn't eventually explain. Why would this year be any different? After taking a few more steps, I made it to the landing between the floors, where I told the guys to quiet down so I could stop and listen. 
When I've been walking, I could only hear my own footsteps and the guys giving me shit, but not a peep from upstairs. And for a moment, that was comforting. But now I thought, wait, was there a maintenance worker or security guard upstairs? I mean, we did all hear what sure sounded like, fo- uh, sounded like footsteps. So where did they go? If they were up there a few moments ago, they should still be up there and I should still hear them, but I don't. I waited a few more moments and strained to listen. Still hearing nothing and not happy about that, I continued on up, really hoping that any moment I'd hear the jingle of a big ring of keys or a walkie-talkie transmission, something from someone working above me. A few moments later, I made it. The unkempt second floor was a stark contrast to the renovated floor below. The hallway that stretched out before me looked like it hadn't been touched in years. Or at least uh, what I could see using the light from my phone looked like that. Why didn't I try and find a flashlight? We had a few. I kicked myself for not thinking of that. Old furniture, random random belongings, and creepily some toys lay scattered all the way down the hall in the dim light, with the doors open to all the old patient rooms. An overturned tricycle lay on its side about halfway down, handlebars sticking out of a doorway. Someone add that to make the area look even creepier? Or did it belong to some kid? Some kid who probably died on this floor. I shivered. A little bit of uneven light from some lights in the moon outside trickled in through the windows, not doing much to illuminate anything, but definitely making everything scarier with all the extra shadows. Then, I heard it again. That same thudding on the floor from before, only this time it wasn't muffled by being heard through the ceiling above. And now, now I started getting a little freaked out. Maybe more than a little. It wasn't footsteps, like we'd all thought. It sounded like a, like a ball. I was hearing what sounded exactly like a child's bouncing toy ball, making its way across the room. It sounded like it was slowly bouncing its way to a stop. My eyes couldn't have been more wide open as I tried to scan the darkness around me, looking for the source of the sound, hoping it was just someone fucking with me. Maybe one of the other guys had quietly walked down the hall on the floor below, then walked up another set of stairs on the other end of the building to hide out in the darkness and scare the bejesus out of me. They would all have a good laugh about it. Not a bad plan, really. As I braced myself, waiting for one of my coworkers to suddenly jump out from the shadows screaming, maybe wearing some costume from the haunted house we worked on, I heard the ball start up again. Like someone had just picked it up and started playing with it. And then I heard what sounded like footsteps in addition to the bouncing. Sounded like someone was getting closer and closer to me, someone also bouncing a ball. I swung the light on my phone back and forth across the room, my brain struggling to process how I could be hearing something that sure sounded like it was coming from somewhere directly in front of me, but not see anything. And then a giggle erupted from the dark emptiness directly in front of me. A laugh so loud and ecstatic that I jumped back and fell down, my arm barely keeping me from really hurting myself. The sound of giggling echoed down the hall as I righted myself, eyes still searching, ready to see someone, hoping to see someone turn that giggle into a full belly laugh as they revealed their prank. But there was no one. I made it to my feet, my nerves shot, my heart pounding out of my chest now. I heard my friends call up to me, they must have heard me fall. And then before I could say anything to them, I heard the ball again. I heard it bounce twice, maybe three times. And then still using my phone as a flashlight, I watched it, I saw it now, I watched it bounce out of the shadows and I reached out and grabbed it. A red rubber ball, kind of like the ones I remember from playing dodgeball back in grade school. I pointed my light in the direction it came from, saw nothing but an empty wall. But then I heard that giggle again, coming from exactly where I was staring, where there was nothing. After hesitating for a moment, I slowly bounced the ball back in that direction, like you would if you were passing it to some kid. And I swear to God, I swear on my life, I saw that damn ball freeze in midair. Freeze like someone grabbed it, like whoever was giggling had grabbed it. And then it came back towards me, bouncing on the floor in front of me. It paused in thin air, then changed directions. I started screaming, turned and ran back the stairs as fast as I could. My friends below all but one immediately gave me shit, but when I pushed back with, at least I was brave to go up there and shared my story, they let it be and we headed back to work. The guy who shared the story about the girl could not have been happier. I told you, I fucking told you, he shouted. And then before we made it more than 50 feet from the stairs, we all heard something coming down the stairs. That ball, that bouncing ball. It bounced down the stairs, and then after it reached the bottom, rolled towards us, stopping just a few feet away. No one was laughing now. 
and no one who still claimed that they had a reasonable explanation for everything was willing to go upstairs. That was the last Halloween I worked at the Hill. Apparently, the girl on the second floor is one of seg- uh, several regularly seen spirits that haunt the old Arkansas sanatorium. I found myself thinking about that day from time to time, wondering who the girl is or was. One of these days, I hope to make it back up there and try and contact her, find out who she is. But next time, I will sure as hell be not be exploring alone. What is it about? Like, not about- <laughs> what is it about the bouncing ball that like just messes us all up? Is it, it's been done in so many movies. It's like, you know, it, it's like rolled out mm-hmm. or it's just bouncing on its own. It's like, oh, and they have it's used so it. upsetting. Yeah, they've used it in Paranormal Investigators too, like balls where it's like, um, you know, working with this theory that the spirits can change physical things in this world, but it takes great energy for them to do so. Yeah. That basically like a ball uh, that could, uh, you know, not roll by itself but easily be rolled if mm-hmm. something just gave it a little bit of force. Yeah. You know, like, uh, yeah, but I remember in previous, like, stories, like, certain investigations, you know, like, people setting balls on, like, stairs, you know, and waiting to see if it'll start rolling down on its own. Yeah. And then that happening, and yeah, it would be so creepy. Ah. And I mean, this, you know, a little bit more intense where it's, like, bouncing like a like a kid would bounce, like, yeah. dribbling it. Exactly. And then it, like, stopping. Mm-hmm. And bounced it, too. It's, like, caught and then bounced back. And then freezing in the air. <sighs> She yeah. doesn't feel harmful, though. Nope. I will say, mm-hmm. it's like, I, I suppose, if this was your encounter, it could be yeah. worse. Oh, it could be way worse. You know, Nothing it could have, like, chased you down the, the stairs mm-hmm. or... I mean, just, who, just spooky. Who knows what else is up there? Yeah. I have, I have pictures. Okay, okay. But it's um, terrifying. Yeah, the first few are just, you know, like, exterior. This first is an old, early to mid-20th century uh, illustration of the Arkansas Sanitarium. Or Sanatorium. Uh, according to the internet... Uh, Oh, no, no, wait a minute. This is the, not the illustration. This is the photo. Okay, never mind. I was thinking of the next story. Um, uh, That big building there in the background on the right, as we look at it, is the Nyberg building. Okay. And then this next pic is of some kids who were staying in the children's hospital wing of the Nyberg building in the early 1940s. Hopefully, some of these kids were able to recover with uh, brand new antibiotics, as opposed to the untold number of, you know, kids who died of consumption in this place previously. I'm so sad. Yeah. Yeah, all those uh, kids not not doing well. Look at all those little nuggets. I know. Well, hopefully, again, time wise, th- those kids there was a, at least a chance for them. This next this next picture uh, is a picture of that second floor hallway with a tricycle. Maybe not the same one from the story. Yeah, well, yeah, probably not. But that <laughs> looks like a pretty modern tricycle. Mm-hmm. But that is just inherently spooky. And then this uh, last pic, somebody spray painted the words "You'll die" oh, in nice. a creepy hallway in the building. I'm sure that'd be fun to see if you snuck in there at night. I don't know if that would really bother me. Yeah, because it is just like a it's re- like, okay. reeks of just like some teens. Yeah. But that hallway, don't care for that. I know, I know. There is something inherently, like you were talking about like the, the ball being spooky, inherently creepy just about long hallways. Mm-hmm. Long, dark, empty hallways. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I think it is, like it makes sense to me when you really think about it where it's like, there could be anything in any one of the rooms, and there's so many rooms mm-hmm. that, like, walking down there, you just um, don't know what you could encounter because you can't see what could be in any of those rooms right. as you stare down there. It's like so many potential threats. I think that's why haunted houses are often in these old, you know, abandoned buildings because yeah. it's like rooms and rooms of horror. So yeah. many opportunities yep. to just— It naturally builds tension. Mm-hmm. You're walking down there, bracing yourself for, like, the next room. Okay. And then maybe you relax and then you're going to brace yourself for the next and the next and the next. Yeah. Yeah. When's it going to get you? Well, at some point. The the combination of the bouncing ball, the footsteps, and the giggles, mm-hmm. I, I think I may have pissed my pants if that was me. I yeah. just, it's too many things. Yeah. Too many spooky minor elements that like by themselves in, you know, in regular life, not mm-hmm. a big deal. Like we all love the sound of children laughing. It's so sweet. And, yeah. You know. Little pitter patter of footsteps, but alone on the second floor in a haunted building by yourself, that three, that is like a deadly combo. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's great. That was a great story. Thank okay, you. Good, good. Uh, you ready to leave a sanatorium in Arkansas and explore a Scottish castle? Let's go. Bit of history now before we're exploring the spooky stuff. Castle Fraser. And I like that they um, flip it and call it Castle Fraser instead of Fraser Castle, by the way. Just a little note. Thank you. Sounds thank cooler you for, to me. Thank you for sharing that. <laughs> it's located near the village of Kenmay in the Aberdeenshire region of Scotland. And it is Shire, 
I got in a lot of trouble in the past from English listeners where a lot of the shires in England are um, shires. Shires. Mm -hmm. But in Scotland, a lot of the shires are shires. Just going to throw that out there. A little preventative. Uh, this, this, is, this isn't time suck. People over here are <laughs> ridiculing your small human error. <laughs> uh, this centuries-old castle sits on more than 300 acres of land. Archaeological evidence shows that one part of the castle was constructed almost 600 years ago, around 1450. Construction for the remainder began in 1575. It was overseen by the modern castle's namesake, Michael Fraser, the sixth Laird of Fraser, kind of like Lord, I feel. Lord Fraser. Laird Fraser. Uh, it was completed in 1636. The Fraser family lived there for generations until Frederick Mackenzie Fraser, the last male Fraser of the direct line, died in 1897 without having any heirs. His widow, Theodora, that's a name you don't hear a lot anymore. Was I actually love that name. Theodora? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, she outlived him by decades, then sold the castle in 1921 due to financial troubles. Wheatman Pearson, first Viscount Cowdray, was the man who bought it. I'm sorry, what was his name? His, his name was Wheatman Pearson, and he was the first Viscount Cowdray. Sure. Mm -hmm. He was the man who bought it. The Pearsons restored the castle as a shooting lodge, gave it to the National Trust for Scotland in 1976, and Castle Fraser is now open to the public. Visitors can walk through its large, grandiose halls and explore things that seem more like something you'd find on a movie set than anywhere in a real former residence, like hidden trap doors and secret staircases. And they can scroll through uh, or stroll through the immaculately, uh, immaculately landscaped garden and castle grounds. One well-known feature of the castle is a small room called Laird's Lug, believed that the room was used to spy on guests and store valuables. Mm -hmm. visitors can see what looks like a ventilation hole above the fireplace in the great hall, but that hole was not built for ventilation. It was built for spying. It was how residents of the castle could hide in there and listen in on guests having conversations, uh, you know, they believed to be private. And Castle Fraser is, of course, reportedly haunted. There are a few resident spirits that both visitors and staff have claimed to have encountered over the years. According to local legend, a princess was once an overnight guest at Castle Fraser. She was staying in the green room, and then murdered while she slept. Her killer then dragged her body down the stairs, staining the floor red with her blood, and her blood stains proved impossible to be removed, so new floorboards were installed on the stairs to hide them. What couldn't be hidden, though, was the returning ghost of the princess. The princess's spirit may still haunt the castle, eternally angry over her death and the fact that her killer, or killers, got away with it. Some have claimed to see her mutilated apparition walking around the green room. Others say they've heard a woman screaming in the middle of the night. There are even a few stories of her bloodstains eventually rematerializing on the stairs. And these stains are said to reappear no matter how much the staff scrubs them. I guess those new floorboards didn't do the trick in the long run. There are no official records of any princess being murdered in the castle's long history, but the legend and the sightings associated with it persist to this day. Castle also reportedly haunted by the ghost of another woman, who is sadly no stranger to violence, Lady Blanche Drummond. Lady Drummond is said to have died of connecting this with the first story I told today, tuberculosis in 1874. Lady Drummond was the wife of Frederick Mackenzie Fraser, and he was known apparently for physical cruelty and a quick temper. Lady Blanche's eternally sorrowful apparition, always seen wearing a long black gown, still roams the halls of Castle Fraser, arousing intense feelings of fear in anyone who sees her, the lady in black. There was also said to be many nameless other spirits trapped somehow within the castle walls. Numerous visitors and staff have heard disembodied whispers, piano music, and the sounds of children's laughter when no children are present on the property. The, spirit, uh, the spiritual activity most often seems to occur in and around the great hall and kitchen. Many of the castle's ghost stories have been passed down over the years by the staff that work there. The following are two anonymous stories collected from staff who worked at the castle at some point over the past few decades. Time now for the tale of the ghosts of Castle Fraser. We were hosting a children's Halloween event on the grounds, an outdoor-only event. Everything went smoothly that day. It seemed like the families and children all had a nice time, and the trust earned a sizable amount from ticket and food sales. After all the families had left for the afternoon, I was tasked with walking through the garden to make sure there were no stragglers remaining. I remember it was a cold yet sunny day, nothing out of the ordinary for that time of year. The garden felt especially peaceful, with no one else there. I pulled out my phone for a quick picture. It was rare that I got to see the garden completely empty. As I lifted up my phone, I saw a shadow flip past the corner of my eye. I immediately turned my head and saw nothing unusual. 
The only movement around me was a few gently falling leaves. I thought perhaps that's what spooked me. I continued with my walkthrough, making sure to check behind the tall bushes, not only for any lost visitors, but also for any litter or other debris that needed to be collected. I felt like someone was watching me as I finished inspecting the garden. It seemed like a ridiculous thought at the time. I knew I was the only one there, and I checked all the possible hiding spots. Still, I was distinctly nervous. As I was heading back to the entrance, I heard a rustling sound off in the distance. I turned around and immediately heard the sounds of footsteps on the stone walkway directly behind me, followed by a rush of wind and the feeling of someone running past me. I whipped my head back around to try and catch the culprit, but all I saw was an empty walkway. Just then, I swore I heard the faintest echoes of a child's laughter and convinced myself it was just the wind. But I knew without a doubt that there were no living people in the garden besides myself. I'd heard stories that the castle was haunted, but I'd never experienced anything myself. Now I wondered if I was the chosen victim of a resident spirit's antics. I thought it would be best to ignore it. I rushed to the exit, and as I did, my eyes shifted to the ground and I nearly jumped a foot in the air when I saw a small, child-shaped shadow walking next to my own. For a third time, I turned around to look behind me, and of course, nothing was there. By that point, I'd had enough. I left the garden and didn't look back. This was the only time I ever saw or heard something unexplainable at Castle Fraser. However, for the remainder of my time there, I always felt like someone was watching me, a sensation I experienced time and time again, and one not just limited to inside the garden's walls. It was like once whatever I saw that day noticed me and made contact with me, it never stopped noticing me. And now for a second modern Fraser Castle claimed encounter. I remember that it occurred sometime later in the evening. A team had come in to clean the inside of the castle, and I was sent upstairs to repair a broken hinge on one of the bedroom doors. I didn't mind working alone in the castle, not even at night. It could be drafty, sure, and there were plenty of noises throughout the old structure, but I didn't think there were actual spirits. I didn't believe any of the odd stories I'd heard, which is what I told my coworkers when they tried to regale me with their tales of the paranormal. In a way, I think my skepticism protected me, at least it did for a while. I was never intentionally seeking out any spirits, and if I did hear an odd noise, I just ignored it. Until the day I chose not to, I guess. I was tightening up the door hinge when I heard brisk footsteps out in the hallway. It sounded to me like a heeled shoe striking the floors, and I thought that was odd. It's not as if I was always looking at what everyone was wearing on their feet, but I didn't think anyone would be wearing heels that day. We were there to clean, not exactly the type of work you put on fancy footwear for. After a few moments, I shrugged it off and continued my work, opening and closing the door several times to make sure everything was now in working order. Once the job was complete, I put my tools in my bag and prepared to head downstairs to see what else needed to be done. But when I stepped out into the hallway, I noticed one of the doors at the very end had been left open, while all the others were closed. I felt compelled to walk over and take a look inside. I wondered if perhaps someone needed my help with whatever task they were working on. Strangely, I felt the air become distinctly colder the closer I got to the door. This is a particularly long hallway, and it seemed like the chill increased with every step. I soon started to feel nervous, which didn't sit right with me. When I peeked into the room, I froze. It was dark. No lights, lamps, or candles were lit, but I could still see just well enough. I was looking at a woman, standing at the window, her back turned to me. She was wearing a long black dress and seemed to have some sort of veil covering her head. If she noticed my arrival, she made no indication to that end. I was taken aback for a moment. Was this some costumed performer preparing for an event I was not aware of? I cleared my throat, knocked on the doorframe. Excuse me, miss. Can I help you with anything? She now slowly turned around to face me, but she kept her head down, the veil obscuring her face. I felt the need to take a step back. I'm not a small man, not one to scare easily, but I didn't like the way this woman was acting. Something about her made my heart beat faster and my palms became damp with sweat. I wasn't even thinking of the paranormal at this point. I thought she was just someone who was unstable, who had snuck into the castle without us noticing. Is everything? My voice cut off as she took a step closer now. And then another. And another. I almost fell over backwards, backpedaling as she started to run towards me, her long dress flowing behind her. I dropped my tool bag as I sped down the hallway, preparing to shout for help. But instead of hearing heeled footsteps pursuing me, I heard the heavy door slam back down the hall. I paused, turned back around, stared down at the room I had just ran out of, and my eyes were immediately drawn to my red tool bag. I was positive I dropped it just inside the doorway. 
I'd already mentally accepted when I started to run that I wasn't going to get it back until the next morning. But now it was sitting just outside the newly closed door. Still not ready to believe that I'd just seen a ghost, the infamous Lady in Black, whom I'd heard so much about, and honestly embarrassed that some trespasser had scared me so, I took quick strides towards the tool bag, prepared to confront the woman and demand she leave the premises immediately before I called the authorities. I reached down to pick up the bag, and then my whole body froze when the door swung open. I expected to be greeted by the strange woman in the black dress, but instead, the room looked empty. More angry now than scared, with adrenaline pumping through me, I searched the room. I looked everywhere for her, checked under the bed, in the closet and wardrobe, every other place I could think of where she might possibly hide. She was nowhere to be found. But I knew she couldn't have left the room without me noticing. One moment she was there, and the next moment she was not. That's impossible. I stood there confused for a few minutes, maybe longer. Finally, rather than continue to try and analyze what had just happened, it was making my head spin, I thought it would be best to just leave before something else happened. I noticed, as I left, that the cold spot was gone as I returned to the stairs. Reflecting on the incident later, I suppose the temperature returned to normal was a signal that the woman in black was no longer present. I never told my coworkers what I saw that day, and I thought it would be best to keep up the appearance of being a skeptic for the remainder of my time there. Even though I was now at least some sort of believer. I mean, what else could explain what happened to me other than I saw a ghost? Nothing else makes sense. Absolutely nothing. From then on, whenever I heard something strange, I made sure to pay it no mind. Just because I'd seen one ghost, that did not mean I wanted to see another. I mean, I agree with that. <laughs> yeah, if you heard... One, an, one's enough. If you heard another door open, just be like, nah, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. I'll be, I'll be back later when you're done. Thanks, but no thanks. Yeah, as soon as you felt the temperature drop, just like, nah, I'm going to take <laughs> off. <laughs> see ya. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. I mean, I guess you could like protect yourself that way. I guess, Yeah. Yeah. You have pictures? I do. I this first one, a cool illustration of Castle Frazier from sometime before photos were uh, being taken. I mean, come on. That's majestic. Build me a castle, bro. And this next one, a more modern photo. I mean, it is it is gorgeous. Very well maintained now. Oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. And and you said it's open to the public. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But you can't like stay there. It's just more of a museum. Tours and stuff, I yeah. believe. Yeah. Uh, this next, a portion of the castle's walled garden. Okay, honestly, beyond, like, forget about the castles, Secret Garden was, like, maybe my favorite thing as a kid. Yeah, yeah. I just loved the idea of, like, hide-and-go-seek in there and playing oh, in there yeah. and building little, like, fantasies with each mm -hmm. little vignette within the garden. And it's such an They're impressive so cool. feat. Yeah, those super well-maintained, like, landscaped, you know, yeah. uh, gardens. Yeah. Uh, this next picture, the uh, infamous staircase with wood flooring now, not covered in bloodstains in this photo. Hmm. Yep, one of those little, in the turrets, one of those little spiral staircases. Rapunzel, Rapunzel, let down. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then this next one, a, a hidden staircase beneath a trap door in the Great Hall. Hmm. So I love that they had those for like quick escape or for yeah. spying or whatever. And then uh, final picture, this is Sir Gregory and Sir Galahad, two knights sworn to protect uh, Castle Fraser. Sir Gregory. Oh. Or this is a pick of two guys who took the 2022 NorCal Renaissance Fair in Hollister, California, very seriously. I like it. I respect the commitment. Feels like something our friend Isaac would be all about. Oh God, yeah. Like going full night. He just likes a costume. Mm -hmm. uh, it also just looks really hot to me. Like <laughs> yeah. sweaty hot. I'm like, oh, buddy. It's miserable under there. I got I got sucked into uh, Renaissance Fair stuff with like just after that photo. Yeah. And I, I love that there are like, you know, known kind of figures in that world that go to multiple fairs. Oh, it's like, did you see John? Well, yeah, there's like stars of like the Renaissance Fair world. Hilarious. Tend to be the um, jousting knights, it seems. Oh, okay. Well, yep, I'm, people that like will do. That is impressive. Yeah, armored horse, full-on chain mail, actual jousting uh, pole, and we'll do like uh, jousting in tournaments. Do you understand how heavy chain mail is? No, I've never, uh, but it's got to be so heavy. Oh, it's wild. Just like having worked in costumes, you would have, like, if you needed that, if you needed chain mail costuming, <laughs> yeah. you know, it's like, you wouldn't even be able to use the full, uh, you wouldn't be able to use like all metal chain mail. Oftentimes it's plastic. Yeah, because it's just too heavy. It's just too heavy, but you would need some of it to get that, that like clinking sound, that like shimmying sound, yeah. you know, pro con for the sound department. Sometimes they loved it. Sometimes they wanted to kill you. But yeah, just like, it is so weighty. 
I guess that was like their their gym back in the medieval days where like they didn't have like modern weight equipment, obviously. But uh Obby. if you're, you know, practicing doing some sword play with heavy chain mail on, yeah. That would have been quite the workout. Actually, I was just skimming an article recently about how like going to the gym, working mm-hmm. out is really just like a modern phenomena. Yeah. It's, it's like not something that we were ever doing before. No. It's like, I mean, which is obvious, but then reading like whole science, it was, I think it was like science today or something. I was like, oh yeah. That reading that article is when is when I decided I could just sleep this <laughs> month and not work out. I know. Now I'm having all these funny images in my head now of like like uh, Beethoven, but like on like a um, pre core. Like Did you lip- say Beethoven? Hmm, Beethoven, the composer. On like Beethoven. A- Beethoven. Yeah. How, how many times do I have to say it? You said Beethoven. Oh, Beethoven. Oh, sorry. I was like, I was like, I thought you had never heard of Beethoven. No, I was like, I thought you said Beethoven. Like two words. Uh-huh, and I was like, who? I'm sorry, what? <laughs> yeah, I didn't understand what was happening there. Okay, yeah, yeah. But I was picturing him like on like an elliptical machine. <laughs> uh, well, I'll, I'll take emails on that. He did say Beethoven. I'm sure I did. I'm sure okay. I did. But it was like but, a weird like pause or glitch in your yeah, throat. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, I was, yeah. For a second, I was like, wait, how, like, how is it possible that Lindsay's never heard of this He's composer? Like, She's 39 years old. Does she? <laughs> have you heard of other ones? Mozart? What? Tchaikovsky? Mozart? <laughs> Mozart? Uh, okay, just before I dive into my stories, uh, last night, I wanted to tell you, so you were, you've were you been really tired, not been getting great sleep, so yeah. I got into bed just maybe 10 minutes after you. Yeah. Kyler was downstairs playing FIFA, uh-huh. and Roe had already gone to bed, and the dogs were kind of doing a little bit of wandering around the house, which is never great for me because generally we put the dogs in our room, close the door, and call it good. So when I hear the jingle jangle of their collar, I know already that they're in the room, or if I hear feel like pressure on the bed, I know it's them. Yeah. Well, last night, Penny was in bed with us. Gigi was not. She was nowhere to be found. Whatever. Left the door cracked. And I was about to fall asleep. I was in that like weird dozy space mm-hmm. where I heard jingle jangle and I felt pressure on the bed. But oh. Penny was already saddled up next to my thighs and Gigi was not in there. And my heart went through my chest. I swear to it was the craziest feeling. And I just, I was like, okay, calm down. And then about mm, 30 to seconds, 30 to 60 seconds later, I heard the click clack of Gigi's feet on the wood floor. And uh-huh. then she came in our room and then she jumped on our bed. Uh, well, I know what she was doing uh, after this morning. Well, well, she didn't poop up there overnight. She might have. I don't oh, know. Oh, you said that you got up this morning and let her out, and then you went to the bathroom, and then when you went no, back up. No, you must have missed her. I, I, I didn't. I I got up. Yeah. I, like, you know, they raced to go upstairs to go the, as they do, but yeah. I had to go to the bathroom. Oh. So I wondered if, like, while I was going to the bathroom, that's when Gigi might have pooped upstairs. Yeah. But she probably pooped upstairs last night. In well, the- well, without getting into long conversations about the consistency and the temperature of the poop, <laughs> that's how you would know when it happened. Yeah, it wasn't hot. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you for that. But yeah. anyways, yeah. regardless of what she was doing, mm-hmm. there was like a weird like phantom. You're missing the whole spooky part. It's like something climbed onto our bed last night that was not Gigi. Wait. So it's, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I did I did miss it. I, I just, I'm like, yeah, I'm like, where is this going? So- how did, how, what was the sequence of events again? Yeah, okay, you come I, into bed okay, 10 minutes were, after I am. You were in bed. You yeah. were asleep. I got into bed. Penny got into bed. She was saddled up next to me. Yes. Then I was like about to fall asleep where I distinctly heard Penny was laying down. Yeah, Penny's okay? on the bed. Okay. Gigi's nowhere to be found. Got it. Okay. I hear the 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 like sound of her little collar. Gigi's collar. Yeah. A collar. Mm-hmm. And then pressure on the bed. Yep. And, but it like scared me awake because I was mm-hmm. like, whoa, what's happening? And then I was like reassessing. And Penny still hadn't moved. And then the next thing I know, after hearing collar and feeling pressure on bed, I hear the click clack of her on the wood floor. So not in our bedroom. And then she comes into our room. So there was like phantom dog noise, pressure on the bed. Gigi was not in the room. Penny was already situated in her spot. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I know it's one of those half asleep. I I see what you're saying. It's like when you're tired and I mean. Yeah. But then I was wide awake and then, and then Gigi came in the room. So hmm. like, what was, what was there before Gigi was there? Penny. No, but Penny was already I like know. settled in. She wasn't moving or anything. She was sound asleep. I don't know. I'm going to, ch- I'm going to chalk that one up. I see what you're saying, but I'm going to chalk that one up to being in that hazy, kind of going to sleep, two dogs, sometimes they're on our bed, sometimes they're not moving around, not used to it because uh, we let them like the door open because of Kyler playing downstairs. I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. That scared the shit out of me. <laughs> I bet. Yeah. All right. Well, anyways, now that you've heard that story twice. <laughs> now that you heard that. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to punch you. 
Are you ready? I am. Are you going to focus and listen to my story? I, I am focused. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So let's find out what's going on in this weird small town. Or not. I don't know. I've had paranormal experiences my whole life. The absolute worst one by far happened at my grandmother's house when I was 14. She lived in the country, surrounded on all sides by woods. The next closest house was two miles away, and the nearest town was a 20-minute drive. It was a small town with a population under 1,000 people with one flashing red light at the only four-way intersection in town. We'd travel up there several times a year, and I was never afraid before this incident. Sometimes my mom and I would head up there for a weekend. She'd save up her vacation time for the holidays and we'd go. In the summers, she'd take me there and then leave me with my grandma while I didn't have school. I'd play in the woods without a care in the world, made friends with the local deer population, and overall, my preteen years spent in that house were absolutely magical. When we were up there for the weekend, just as summer break had started, my mom and grandma headed into town. I was deep into the start of a video game and I didn't want to go with them. The locked, they locked the doors and told me to stay away from the doors and windows and not to answer it for anyone unless I recognized them. The rest of the day was great, honestly. As the sun began to set, the house phone rang. I had a cell phone at the time, but the signal up there was spotty, and so we didn't rely on it. It was my grandmother saying that they were going to be in town for a bit longer, and she asked me to close up the house. This meant closing the blinds, turning on some lights so it looked like people were home, that kind of thing. I said sure, hung up, and went about doing as I'd been told. For some context, this is an old farmhouse. It's fairly set back from the road with a long driveway. The garage is at the back of the house. Exiting the garage, you enter a breezeway. From the breezeway to the mudroom, you take everything off, your shoes, hang up your coat, and then that connects into the kitchen. From the kitchen, there's a sliding pocket door that goes to the den, and then two more pocket doors that connect to a small living room that also has a small side room where my grandmother slept. The kitchen had an arch that led into the same living room. Across from the arch was the first floor bathroom, and further back from there was a small room that had served as my grandfather's office, but had been converted into a guest room where I often slept. I started going around, closing all the curtains. And while I was in the living room, I heard someone call out my name. Just a quick, Jay! And it sounded a bit like my mom. Over the sink was a window that looked into the breezeway, which had windows that looked into the driveway. I didn't see my mom's car, and the lights in the garage weren't on, but uh, no one but me was home. Thinking that I was hearing things, I went about continuing to close up the house. The last bout of it was going into the mudroom and making sure the doors in the breezeway were locked. As I exited the mudroom into the kitchen and closed the doors, I heard my name again. It was a bit of a sing-song this time, almost mocking. Jay! I looked into the mudroom, but I didn't see anyone. As I turned to close the pocket door that led from the kitchen to the den, I froze. There was something in the back corner of the den, a dark shadow that was somehow deeper than the darkness around it. Staring back at me were glowing red eyes. Panic rose up in me. I grabbed the house phone from on top of the ice chest and sprinted for the bathroom. It was the only room on the first floor that had a lock. I called my mom. Hello? Her voice sounded so, so distant in that moment, and all I could do was start crying. Hello? Jay? What's wrong? I could hear her starting to panic when I wasn't answering. There's someone in the house, I sobbed. What? My mom asked, a bit alarmed. There's someone in the house, I repeated. What's in the house? My mm -hmm. grandmother's voice came through, sounding panicked but stern. I don't know. It looked like a shadow, and it called my name. I didn't know if she'd believe me. I didn't even know if I believed me. Where are you? My grandmother asked. In the bathroom. I locked the door. I answered. Call 911 and tell them someone has broken in. Do not leave that bathroom until the police get there. My grandmother hung up. I dialed 911, told the dispatcher I was home alone and someone had broken in. The police got there before my mom and my grandma did, but they couldn't find anyone else in the house or any signs of forced entry. What they did find was that the sliding door in the den that led into the back near the woods was slightly ajar. The official police report says that the door was likely unlocked and the intruder had gotten in that way and then had left when they heard me crying on the phone calling the cops. It was likely a homeless person or one of the people that lived out in the woods, thinking no one was home or that the house was an easy target. My grandmother, however, knew better. She went along with the official police report. When my mom left for home and I was alone with my grandma for the summer, she told me what I had seen. The demon in the woods, as it was known. 
She shared with me that the town had had many, many missing people. So many reports of no forced entry into people's homes, and then the people just vanish. She took me to see a friend of hers because the demon had taken his wife. She was a housewife, and one day the husband came home from work and she was just gone. Their second car was in the driveway, the doors were locked, her purse and her wallet, everything was there. Everything was where she'd always left it, pristine, but she was gone. The police dismissed it and said she must have taken a walk into the woods or something and that she would be home soon, but she never returned. They searched the woods near the house and never found a single trace of her. The whole town knew stories like this. Everyone there knows firsthand or secondhand someone who's gone missing. If I hadn't noticed that thing, if I hadn't had the good sense to grab the phone and lock myself in the bathroom, I could have been just one more story to add to the collection. Grandma said there were a few people who survived to tell the tale like me, but they never lasted more than a few years before they went missing too. After that, I was never alone in the house again. Every time we visited, if mom and grandma went into town, I'd almost run to the car to go with them. Anything was better than being alone in that house, risking the demon taking me like it did so many others. Flash forward, Christmas 2015. This was the last time I visited that farmhouse. In 2019, my mom retired and moved to the small town. My grandmother moved out of the farmhouse and into town with her. My grandmother hadn't been well for several years before that, having had hip and knee replacements and needing visits from hired help several times a week. Living alone in the middle of nowhere just wasn't safe for her anymore. They put the house up on the market, but as of 2021, it was still for sale. Some friends and Some friends of mine and I were in the area and were looking at potentially purchasing the property for ourselves. Given that the house had five bedrooms and two full baths, it seemed perfect, and the price was right. We were walking around with the realtor, taking a tour of the place, and as we went around the back of the house, close to the woods, I saw something move in the trees. A shadow darker than dark with glowing red eyes staring at me. One of my friends noticed I was frozen in place and asked what was wrong, but even when I pointed it out, they couldn't see it. Thankfully, the plans for all of that fell through, and I live happily in the suburbs, surrounded by people. But even here, I'm scared to be alone in the house. A few times, I've been taking the trash out later than I'd like, and I swear I've seen a shadow figure with red eyes in the distance, watching me. I think going back up there to look at that property somehow made it catch my scent again, like maybe it gave it a renewed desire to find me and not let me be one that got away. I don't know what it is, and I hope I never find out. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Sorry, just cough hit me right, yeah, right, right, as I, right at that moment. Um, I was thinking, like, I don't know how big this town is, like, what the population of this place is. Yeah. But um, if, if like, at what point do you leave town? It, what, like, like right. as, as opposed, like, get the fuck out, but out of a town as opposed to a house. Sure. Where if your town becomes known for people disappearing from places where there were no signs of a break in leave, move, yeah. like put all your energy into like, how do I get out of this town? Yeah. Cause I'm just thinking like, like, I mean, Riggins, you know, just my point of reference, my little hometown. I can't think of a single person who ever just disappeared. Really? From Riggins. No. Like, like, um, you know, people would move, but no one sure. just disappeared. And I know people go missing. Like many people go missing every year in, in, mm-hmm. in, in America, but <laughs> like, but if your town is developing a reputation for people seeing weird shit in the woods. Uh huh. And then a lot of those people who see the weird stuff just, just gone. Yeah. I am fucking out of there. I know. That is like. Don't come visit. Right. Yeah. I, I feel like this is like, I, there have been like horror movies about this where it's just like strange things are happening in this town. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and it's like generally not based in anything other than someone's imagination. Right. But if there was some validity, like they say in this story, <laughs> either, everyone either directly or like secondhandedly right. knows somebody that's been, yeah. that's gone missing. After like, Five people, I think I'm GTFO. That makes me think of, uh, and I never had this thought. Well, maybe I did. I just forgot about it. But uh, as a kid with like Pennywise, with it, Stephen King's it. Yeah, I was conjuring thoughts of that. Yeah, as well. like Dairy Maine, I think is where where that. Um, That's correct. Uh, t- uh, story set. Just like, just leave. Mm-hmm. Like as opposed to like, you know, we got to come back. And I mean, I get the nobility of like, we got to stop this thing before it takes any more kids. Right. But if kids are going missing in this town, like as a parent, mm-hmm. if you're a parent of children in a small town and it's a small town known for a lot of kids going missing every couple of generations, maybe leave. I know. Maybe like, find a different town to live in. Sell the house. I understand mm-hmm. the financial constraints, but just like- At least try. Yeah, get out. Send out your resume. I wonder what's not clear in this story, and I do wonder like, is it just out in the 
like it sounds like here's the town mm-hmm. and then 20 minutes away is this like r- more rural area. Yeah, the farmhouse and stuff, yeah. Yeah, so okay, thinking about where like you grew up, is it like are the disappearances in Riggins but Grangeville is safe? You know. Yeah, what's what's like, the area? What's how, how far do you have to go? Yeah, like like are people missing from town or mm-hmm. are they just missing from this sort of more uh rural area? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean gosh, people are stubborn though. I get it. Where I, I mean, I think about my family, a lot of family just, you know, just staying in Riggins, like no matter what, just, yep. this is what we're just going to stay. This is what we do. I don't have that. That's just not my DNA. No. I, I don't mind moving. So I'm no. like, well, I, could just, I could just leave. I could just never, I mean, I love my little town, but if my little town became a hotspot for terror, I'd probably be like, you know what? Hey grandma, how about you just bounce out of that town so we don't have to come visit you? How about we get you out of there? And then none of us, I don't know, ever go there again. How about none of us have to go missing? Yep. How about we just leave it forever? I do understand though, like, uh, you know, when your whole life has lived in a place and it's like, you're, mm-hmm. you're, your family's there, your like chosen second family of friends are there. This is your yeah. routine. Oh, yeah. I get it. And the older you get, it's harder to True. make new friends and start over. Like it's, you know. Yeah. But, but listen, Grandma Betty. Yeah. Well, luckily she's if, living if, in a place where people aren't If old vanishing. people start getting plucked up. We're mm-hmm. we're gonna pluck you up and remove you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you'll go missing because of us. <laughs> we will take you. Uh, but yeah, like that would be so creepy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I would never want to be alone in that house again either. <laughs> and I would also choose to live in the suburbs, surrounded by people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, all right, ready for one more? Yes. Okay. Possible alien abduction, and of course, this just like sets my heart on fire. Maybe this is why I was freaked out last night. I, I was, was thinking of aliens that first story a little bit too. Yo, you. Oh yeah. Being abducted from those houses. No signs of break-in. Yeah. That's the little red thing, the little thing with the red eyes. Alien, maybe. I mean, like lights and... Yeah. Oh, yeah, totally plausible. Hello, Scared to Death crew. I'm a 31-year-old veteran of the Marine Corps and former law enforcement. I tend to be more rational and have a scientifically based thought process, except for when it comes to paranormal stuff. <laughs> I have had way too many experiences growing up to not believe. I experience shadow people, intelligent responses, seeing stuff moving on its own, full body apparitions, feeling someone touch me when I'm alone, recorded EVPs, and I even saw something standing in the hallway that looked like me but didn't have a face. Spooky shit. The only thing I haven't experienced is using a Ouija board. Fuck that. My mom's <laughs> half my mom is half Mexican and therefore a firm believer in everything paranormal. If she would have caught me with the Ouija board, she probably would have beaten me to death with her sandal. <laughs> All that said, I think I might have been abducted by aliens. It was August of 2012, and I was stationed at Marine Corps Air Station New River in Jacksonville, North Carolina. If you know North Carolina in August, the humidity and the heat are oppressive and thick. It was miserable. I'd been there for about a month and was still not acclimated to it. I hated it there. That day was different, though. My barracks roommate was leaving to go to his next duty station. I was ecstatic for this, as he was a bit of a douche, and (laughs) I wanted my own room. I knew it would be temporary, maybe a week or two until I had another roommate, but hey, small victories. The whole day felt off. I woke up and felt static over my skin and my hair. I didn't think much of it other than it was weird. I showered, got dressed, and went about my day. The sky that day was darkened by big, thick, rolling clouds, and the smell of rain danced on the breeze. Throughout the day, I noticed weird lights in the clouds. They were not constant, but occasionally, a flash of blues or greens would quickly illuminate small sections of the clouds. Again, I thought it was weird, but we were stationed at an air station, and of course there were glowing things in the sky. I just figured they were features of aircrafts that I did not know about, nor needed to know about. I assumed if anyone higher up wanted me to know what those blue and green lights were, they would tell me. I did find it strange, though, because a few times when I started to notice the lights, I pointed it out to some of my coworkers, but I was the only one who could see it. Nobody else seemed to notice it at all the entire day. After the first five or so times of seeing it, I just kept my head down and kept working, ignoring the lights. At the end of the day, we were released to go back to the barracks. It was already 7.30 p.m., I was starving, and of course, we were held so late that the chow hall was already closed. I figured I'd eat some ramen in my room, shower, and go to bed. And then I remembered my roommate checked out today. I could go back to my room and actually be alone for once. This thought cheered me up. Maybe eating ramen alone in my room wasn't all that bad. I finished eating, showered, and was lying in my pajamas on top of the covers of my bed. It was still a sticky 90 degrees outside, 85 inside the barracks. We didn't have AC. Thank you, Marine Corps. (laughs) 
Since this heat was inescapable, my pajamas consisted of a tank top and thin basketball shorts. I was lying on the bed, watching something on my laptop, when I dozed off. I had this dream, I think, of bright lights waking me up. As I opened my eyes, they struggled to adjust. It was just so bright. I was lying on a metal bed, like a surgical table, and I couldn't move. I didn't feel or see any straps or anything holding me there. Then I noticed I wasn't alone. There were shadows, or silhouettes rather, moving behind the lights. There were three of them, maybe four. From what I could tell, they were much taller than me. I'm 5'10", so not overly tall, but also not that short. These shadows had to be closer to seven feet from what I could tell. But then again, it was so hard because the damn lights were so bright. They were blinding me. Their movements were average speed, nothing slow or spooky or even blindingly fast. My eyes couldn't focus. I was squinting to shield them from the white light. The shadows appeared to be checking various monitors on a countertop. I felt a tickle in my throat and I coughed. One of them turned quickly and pointed at me. My heart sank. I was so scared that I began to feel the tears well up in my eyes. Then I became aware of a presence at my head. I turned my head upwards just in time to see an arm coming through from behind the lights. It was pale, gray in color. The hand scared the shit out of me. It had three fingers and they were elongated, probably twice as long as my fingers, and they looked like they had an extra joint or two in them as well. It was holding something in its grasp. It was a mask connected to a hose, like the surgical gas mask they put on you for anesthesia. Before I could even react, it was pressed down on my face, hard, as if this thing were mad at me. Everything went black, and I was asleep again. I woke up with a jolt. It felt like I had just fallen into my bed, as if I had been floating above it and then somehow dropped into it. I jumped up, ready to fight anything and anyone that was around. But there was nothing. I was back in my barracks room, alone. My laptop still on, displaying the are you still watching screen over whatever series I had, I had been previously watching. The room was quiet and dark, too dark. I didn't like it. I was terrified. I had never felt fear like that before, and I still have not felt anything like that to this day. I ran the four steps to turn on the light and scanned the room. Nothing. I ran to the bathroom, turned on the lights. Nope, still alone. My heart felt like it was going to beat out of my chest. I sat on the edge of my bed and caught my breath, allowing my heart rate to slow. About five minutes passed, and then the memory of that table, the room, and the shadows crept into my mind. I jumped up and ran to the bathroom mirror. I scanned myself in the mirror, standing back pretty far to see as much of my body as I could. Nothing seemed off. Not at first, anyways. As I walked towards the mirror, I noticed it. It was a line around my mouth and over the bridge of my nose, a line that would have matched the mask's seal perfectly. Was it real? I asked myself out loud. Chills took over my body. I was cold, damn cold actually, and my clothes were drenched, absolutely soaked. Had I sweated through my clothes like this to this extreme? I walked over to the bed and felt the covers, dry. If I'd been sweating like this while dreaming or even during a sleep paralysis incident, wouldn't my bed have been wet too? Even just a little bit damp? I checked the time, almost 4 a.m. I decided that I was staying up. No way was I going back to sleep. I checked every inch of my body that I possibly could. I found no marks, no indication of implants or anything of the sort. I got dressed and left for the chow hall to get breakfast. As the day progressed, it just seemed more and more like a dream. Maybe it was a dream. That would make more sense, right? I had never experienced anything like that before and never anything since. I've never even experienced sleep paralysis throughout my entire life. I've never even had a dream about aliens before that, nor have I had any dreams about aliens since. I'm not sure what happened that night, and it's taken me almost 10 years before I could tell anyone about that experience, and that person was my wife. But of course, she chalked it up to sleep paralysis. I don't know. Stay creepy, scared to death crew, and thank for all, thanks for all you do, your fellow creep, James. Thanks, James. Yeah, and thanks for your service. Um, what do you think? I mean, who, I mean, I mean, his wife, you know, could be right. Yeah, I mean, she be, wasn't there. Right, could be sleep paralysis. You know, he he even speculates that maybe it was. Uh huh. Um, you know, it, I, I like that he added that detail of like never dreamed about aliens before or since, never had sleep paralysis, you know, before or since. Yeah. I mean, even if it was sleep paralysis, that's such a strange phenomenon. Like, why why does it strike out of nowhere? Mm -hmm. Where it's, it doesn't sound like you know he was in any kind of like traumatic period of his life. He was excited to have like a a room to himself for a little bit. Right. He was on base, so we know like 
that he wasn't like doing a ton of drugs or drinking. I mean, I'm yeah. not saying it doesn't happen, but like, you right, know. Right, he didn't, yeah, he didn't mention getting like dishonorably discharged or anything. Exactly, after. It's like, exactly. No, it's like, you know, it's, he's in a place he's familiar with. Life is just going along basically as it was for a while before then. Yeah. If he's in the military for a while, you know, continued along the same, same lines and then just out of nowhere has this really strange, at the very least, super weird, atypical dream, yeah. intense dream. Um, and then, yeah. And then on the other side, it's like, yeah, I, I do. I'm very open to like, you know, aliens and abductions and all that. And I think that absolutely that could have happened to him. And I, I just think that like, okay, if we're going to go with this premise that like, you know, alien life could exist and people are like, why don't we have the bodies? Why don't we have the ships? Why don't we have this? Why don't we have that? They could be so much further evolved than we are. Right. We're like an ant. Like, like what an ant is to us, we are to them. So they want to smush us? No, but they're just so smart compared to us. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. That they could just like hide whatever. Yeah. They could, who knows what they can do. And so I'm very open to like, not only A, aliens existing, but B, we're not going to have physical proof of them mm -hmm. unless it's on their terms. Okay. Okay. Like unless they want us to. I think the two elements of this story that really got me were one, the outline around his face of the mask. When you woke right, up, right, right. That, that's that, that's, that's a, a very dream. specific yeah. shape, you know. That's like, but okay, but even if you could chalk that up to like, well, you know, like bed wrinkles mm -hmm. or you know, okay, the fact that he was soaking wet with sweat, but his bed was dry, that does not make sense. That was the element or like the note mm. in the story that really bothered me. It's true, okay, because as someone who struggles with um, thyroid disorder, it's like yeah. I get really hot in my sleep, and when I have nights of like just being drenched in my my sweat yeah it's like not only are my clothes wet the, the the pillowcase at minimum is very wet yeah if not like patches of sheets so and and he wasn't like i don't know it, it just bothered me that he was very specific like i was lying on top of the blankets because it was so freaking hot in there so even if it was just like mm. a typical hot sweaty night yeah his sheets would be like he even said he goes they weren't even damp I mean, that's true. That's a weird detail. It is a weird detail. How do you sweat but not sweat onto your bed? <sighs> How do you sweat like on the top half only? Right. I was just thinking of like if you just like broke out quickly with the sweat and it didn't have to, time to like soak your, I don't know. I don't know if that's true. Um, I don't know. Yeah, that's a very strange detail. I mean, I guess you could like, yeah, like a fever sweat. Like you could definitely just be like hot and like mm -hmm. clammy and like a little. There's not actually a lot of liquid that would soak your sheets. Yeah. But if his clothes were soaked. Yeah, if, his cl if your clothes were soaked, I mean. And he's on a military base, which like, you know, for all we know, that military base that he was on, it's like maybe secretly the whole purpose of that base is studying alien life form. Oh man, yeah. You, you can really get on the conspiracy well there. Yeah. Where it's like, <laughs> I can get real, real X-Files where it's like, I like it. you know, the base is actually controlled by these, the greys or some, you know, like oh, man, some, I wasn't going that far. Some race of aliens and like, they're the real masterminds of this and they have the, you know, they work with the military leadership to like feed That's them new soldiers. But I'm saying like, I mean, it, you know, it could be like some element of that. Yeah. Yeah. Or it's, or it's just like, you know, their job is to be looking for signs of light, like other life forms. And that's why the aliens are checking out, like, why are you guys checking us out? Yeah, it just, you know, I mean, if, mm -hmm. if we're entertaining this idea that on some level, our government is aware of alien life forms, it's mm -hmm. like, well, they would be stupid not to have some division of people aware of it and studying yeah. it, but like, without causing panic in the American people, yeah, because we get nuts real fast, uh, you know, they're not going to tell us where these bases are. Mm -hmm. They're not going to Area 51, like, hey, over here. Come here, where all this activity is. <laughs> right, right. I don't want to deal with that. I don't know. So many options. Yet another mystery. I know. And I a don't... show full of mysteries. Mystery. <laughs> do you want to? Uh, do you want to thank the Annabelles? Sure, I would love to. I would like to thank the following Annabelles for supporting us uh, in what we do here. Uh, that's a Paulden. That's a Paulden. <laughs> that's a Paulden. <laughs> <laughs> Hannah K. Natalie Morris. Dawn Hernandez, Robert Garcia, Annie the Impaler, Star Bourbon. <laughs> okay, that's a good name. Uh, Kitten Little, Brian Plue, and Michelle Jordan. I got really fun ones this yeah, week. Yeah, you did. I like Annie the Impaler a lot. I know. I, Annie, I think I want to be friends with you. Yeah, because like Vlad is a name that maybe just because Vlad is associated with Vlad the Impaler like all these years that it sounds like somebody who would do impaling possibly. Like, I don't sure. know. It has like a dark ring to it, at least oh, in my God. mind. Annie does not. 
No, in my mind, Annie the Impaler is like, uh, she does like a lot of- um, stitch. Not cross, uh, <laughs> crochet. Crochet. Da, 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 da. Uh, I would like to thank the following Annabelles for supporting us on Patreon. Anne McGee, um, Brady Smith, Charlotte Watts, Chad Gordon, Cedar, Kimberly Sullivan, Karen Carnes, Alan Jenkins, Emma Moroski, and Sam Smith. <gasps> Sam Smith, you're a fan? What? Yeah. Me too. The Sam Smith. Sam, I'm also a fan of you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Spoopy Spoopy shout outs to Isaac from your mom, Elizabeth. Happy belated 20th birthday to my adventure buddy. I love you, kid. Make me proud. Aw. To Ray Lynn from your mom, Jenny. Happy 11th birthday, little one. I love you. To Curtis from Brooke, a father-daughter duo who enjoy the show together. You know what they say, families that spoop together stay together. Yes. To Lucas from Mama and Dad, happy 14th birthday, buddy. We love you. And to Daisy from Mo, happy birthday. All righty. That is another right. show in the books. Uh, thanks for continuing to send your personal tales of terror to my story at scaredtodeathpodcast.com. You can email us for everything else. Info at scaredtodeathpodcast.com. Uh, thanks to Logan Keith for running the store, badmagicmerch.com. Thanks to Tyler C. for producing and directing today. Zach Cohen for some of the custom soundbed creation. Heather Rylander for organizing the My Story emails. And to book editor Drew Atana. Working now, I believe, on book number five. Book number five. Uh, thanks to new occasional producer Ashley uh, McAnelly for finding the first story I told this week. Olivia Lee found the second. Uh, Ashley has a horror podcast. It's all in the cards. Launched last fall, It's All in the Cards is a bi-weekly horror fiction podcast where all questions are welcome, but you may not like the answers. <laughs> the show follows Jade, an Ozark folk witch who runs an occult bookstore and gives tarot readings. Cool. Yeah, yeah. Very fun premise. And that is all for today. Enjoy your nightmares, creeps and peepers. Hope you were scared to death. Bye. If spirits threaten me in this place, fight water by water and fire by fire. Banish their souls into nothingness and remove their powers until the last trace. Let these evil beings flee through time and space. Evil may pass through, but have no home here within scare to death. Bad Magic Productions. I thought you had never heard of Beethoven. No, I was like, I thought you said Beethoven. Like two words. Uh-huh. And I was like, who? <laughs>